and welcome to this British Library Food Season event, the People and Places of Caribbean Food, generously sponsored by KitchenAid. My name is Polly Russell and I'm the Food Season's curator and founder and I work very closely with the food writer Angela Clutton, who is the Food Season's guest director. I am so sad to say that this evening is the season's penultimate event. Uh, we've got one more to come. On Friday, we have the campaigning organisation called Bite Back, who've made a fantastic film, followed by a panel discussion talking about childhood obesity and the problem with our high street. So that is on Friday. So check out the Food Season webpage to book a ticket for that. Just a couple of housekeeping points before we get to, to this evening's event. Um, you'll find tabs on your screen uh, for feedback. We'd love to hear from you. It really helps us to shape our events. There's also a donate button. The British Library is a charity. So if you'd like to support our work, we'd be very grateful. And also really important, there's a tab for questions. And I know that the panel this evening would love to hear from you. So do enter into questions there. So tonight's event, The People and Places of Caribbean Food, with a fantastic panel, Rosamond Grant, Riaz Phillips and Joe Williams, chaired by Naomi Oppenheim. Naomi's going to introduce the panel. I'm going to introduce Naomi, who I'm delighted to know quite well because I work very closely with her at the British Library. Naomi is a doctoral student at the BL and UCL. Her research focuses on the Caribbean diaspora publishing and over the last six months, she's done something slightly different from her research and been working on a fantastic oral history project with the British Library and the Eccles Centre. The Eccles Centre is set up to encourage scholarship and learning using the British Library's America's collections. And Naomi has been collecting oral histories about Caribbean food and connecting these oral histories with British Library holdings. Those oral histories are being archived at the British Library and she's used them as the basis for a series of wonderful blogs which you can find on the British Library's America's pages. I'm absolutely thrilled because I believe that she's going to be playing some extracts from these oral histories today for this uh, panel discussion. So this discussion really is uh, the result of and comes out of Naomi's wonderful work over the last six months and her passion and her enthusiasm about this subject. So I cannot wait to hear more. So over to you, Naomi. Thank you, Polly, and welcome everyone. I'm so excited to get stuck into conversation with our amazing panel for what I'm sure will be an eye-opening and mouth-watering event about Caribbean cooking in the home and beyond. Before I introduce our panellists, I'm going to give a really quick overview of the Caribbean Food Waste Project, which Polly just mentioned. Um, so as Polly said, it's an oral history project which explores people's relationship to food, family, memory and identity. And we call it Food Waste because this incorporates the coming together of the culture, traditions and history of food. So from market stall owners to retired restaurateurs, I've interviewed people from a range of backgrounds. And as Polly said, these interviews are about to be deposited in the British Library Sound Archive, which means they're publicly available for anyone to come and listen to. And she's right, I will be playing some clips tonight, which I'm really excited to share with you. Um, and one of the ideas is really about how do we explore connections between material that we hold at the British Library and personal memories. So how does a family recipe for pepper pot help us to enhance our understandings of Caribbean history more broadly, but also to kind of help us interrogate and challenge the colonial written archive. And you can follow the ongo ongoing blog series where I connect up these stories to collection items by clicking on the link below the question box. So whilst the project is very much focused on the joy, senses and experiences of food, it's also interested in how food has been an, ar an arena for survival and resistance. So I hope that this evening we'll be able to talk about the complexities of the cuisine itself, but also the politics that surrounds Caribbean food. There's going to be plenty of time for questions at the end, so please don't forget to submit them, whether you want to direct them to the whole panel or, or a specific panellist. Without further ado, I'm gonna introduce our wonderful panel who I'm so interested to hear from and really feel honored to be able to chair. I'm thrilled to have the inspirational Rosamond Grant here today. Rosamond is a published cookery writer, food expert, former restaurant owner, and also a psychotherapist amongst many other things. Her 1899, 
1989 book, Caribbean and African Cookery, which I've got here, which is such a beautiful book. Um, and actually had uh, an introduction by Maya Angelou. Um, was an important milestone in bringing Caribbean food to a wider audience. And she's authored several other cookbooks since. During lockdown, Rosamond's been cooking up a much needed storm at her local food bank. And I hope we're gonna hear more about this later. Next up is Riaz Phillips joining us from Berlin. He's a writer, photographer, and publisher. His first independently published and award-winning book, Belly Full, Caribbean Food in the UK, was inspired by his own Jamaican upbringing and has been sold across the world. Alongside doing critical work of documenting the, the, the diversity of Caribbean food, his latest project, Save the Last Dub, documents the last remaining reg reggae record shops. And last year, he published a digital collection called Community Comfort, which has 100 recipes from writers and cooks of colour in the UK, with proceeds going to the Majon Z COVID-19 Bereavement Fund. Last and certainly not least, we have Joe Williams with us from Leeds. Joe is an arts and heritage activist. He created Leeds Black History Walk in 2009 and Heritage Corner in 2014. And he wants to work to disseminate the history of the African diaspora in Yorkshire. Through community arts projects, Joe has brought many celebrated figures of the African diaspora to life. And he's won numerous awards for his historical activism. Joe's a visiting fellow at the University of Leeds and also an honorary fellow at Trinity University in Leeds. Joe was one of my oral history participants in Caribbean Foodways and he shared his expertise on Caribbean food history and also his personal memories of eating at home and across Leeds, which I hope we get to hear about this evening. So I'm going to kick off the event this evening by asking you all, what role does food play in your life today? And Rosamond, I'm going to start with you. Oh, hi. Thank you, Naomi. Ah, uh, gosh, what a big question. Um, I've actually written something down because I thought I'm just going to waffle on otherwise and, and take too much time. So I'm going to sort of read it to start with. So providing wholesome and healthy food is important to me and it's important to well-being. And it's the essence of Caribbean home cooking. And I am a natural feeder. Um, both actually feeding people literally and therapeutically feeding people. As you mentioned, I'm a fact therapist. Um, but I really enjoy producing food. It's my passion. And if I'm not cooking for family and friends, I'm cooking for others. And I find it hard to say no. So, you know, but also I love to see the pleasure it brings to people, that look on the face. My daughter-in-law, uh, Maxine, always goes, mmm, ah, mmm, ah, you know, when she's, tasting things and and that's the joy that I love that I love that um and it stems all of this my relationship with food stems from my upbringing in Guyana um we bonded over food as families meal times are very important to you know to to my family life and in our culture I was very sort of influenced not only by my family but also by my community cooking is, in a truly multicultural country that highly values, you know, the races that we have in Guyana, you know, Indians, Amerindians, Africans, Europeans, and Chinese, you know, that that's that's important, you know, to me. And both my father and mother were good cooks um, when they had time away from teaching. But ironically, my father, who was quite an academic, told me at an early age that if I didn't study, I would end up in the kitchen cooking for my brothers and sisters. And typical teenage rebellion, you know, I decided, right, I'm going to do exactly that. So I, I ended up in the kitchen cooking for my brothers and sisters. I also studied quite hard and um, I made my father eat his words, really. So. <laughs> That's great. Thanks, Rosamond. Um, I'm going to go to Joe next. OK, thanks, Naomi. <clears throat> Um, you said in the introduction that I was an expert in, in, Carib in the history of Caribbean food. I'm just very much interested in the connections of Caribbean food and the importance. Uh, so for myself, I grew up in a, as the youngest in a family of 11, and I'm the only English-born child of Pitney. And um, all of my brothers and sisters can cook amazingly and so that's where I harnessed my interest in being a consumer 
of, um, <laughs> of other people's cooking um, of West Indian food. And um, the memories of that, the contrast of home food and school dinners or going to my friends after school and going, hmm, why is this so different? Um, and then hearing the stories that go alongside it, I thought, hmm, there's a big gap here, and that gap represents me in a way. So it's important that these stories are told, that these links are made. Today, the food means a lot to me because I enjoy Caribbean food every week, not every day, but every week it's a part of my life. And it's important for socializing as well because I share that with certain people who I see on a regular basis and those relationships mean something and are even more enhanced through the food. And we do have discussions about how are we going to make this mean something to young people who like myself weren't born in the Caribbean and didn't have um, brothers and sisters that were born in the Caribbean to vitalize the narratives behind the food. How do we keep that going? Thanks, Joe. Yeah, I think that's really interesting thinking about how food is also a form of, of cultural nourishment for second mm -hmm. and third generation migrants. Um, yes. yes, I'll go to you now, please. I think yeah, much of the same for me. I grew up um, and food specifically Caribbean and West African food. I can remember that as much as I can remember any other food. To me, that is, there's no, the concept of Caribbean or African food doesn't, didn't really exist to me up until a certain point until I went to primary school. It was just food. And then I realized that I was this weird kid eating all this kind of strange smelly food that uh, nobody else knew about. And that's when I kind of understood that we were from somewhere completely different. You know, you can only contextualize those things. Um, I'm slightly old enough that when I was a kid, that wasn't the internet. So you couldn't just go on like Google Maps and actually like see how far away a place was. I just understood that my family wasn't born in the same place that I was, which was England. Um, and uh, I could see that this food was one of the ways that they connected to this place that they were from. Um, the other one being music. Um, and as I got a bit older, obviously over the years and family starts passing away, I kind of understood how important that food was in terms of connecting with that heritage um, and keeping it alive. As, as they mentioned, going forward, I started to see the power of it and how important it was for me to kind of carry the baton and take it forward um, into the next generation. And kind of, yeah, after university, when I started picking up a bit more books and finding out that a lot of this history of, uh, you know, the transatlantic uh, slave trade and Caribbean heritage, stuff that I wasn't taught about in school. I was kind of, my eyes were open to this wealth of information and all these archives that are out there of people who had been documenting it. And I saw there was like a small gap in the UK where I felt it hadn't been documented and to kind of bring that back to food, I found that, you know, everybody eats, everybody loves food. And especially in a place like London, um, people are fascinated with multicultural food. And I realized that that same food was a great way to kind of shoehorn in cultural history uh, to a wider audience. Thanks, Riaz. I just want to say, I think, you know, the work you've been doing has been filling a huge gap of a failure to document Caribbean food in the UK and how that relates to sort of politics and culture more broadly. Um, so during the interviews, the topic of what Caribbean food means came up a lot. And that of course includes questions of not only underrepresentation, but misrepresentation. And so the first clip that I'm gonna play is from Renette Prime, who's a lawyer and food enthusiast, and she set up her own supper club called Eats Beats London. And in this clip, she's explicitly talking about what she calls a loss of distinctiveness. So if we could have clip one now, please. The distinctions between the Caribbean islands and their cuisines is not fully appreciated. And it's a shame really that, you know, the most that people know or think of when they think about Caribbean food is Jamaican jerk chicken and, or rice and peas or just, or just roti from Trinidad. 
you know, and there's so much more. I think in terms of competition and survival, you, you kind of lose some of your um, distinct characteristics of your island because you're trying to just win over people to your food and just be a business, a food business. So I would love to see more of, like I said, like the Pilores and the Pepper Pots and the Callaloos and all those kind of recipes that um, I associate that people don't always know about more at the forefront and realising, oh, that's actually from Trinidad, that's actually from Guyana, that's from Dominica, that's from St. Vincent. And just appreciating that they all have different accents to what they do and and people are appreciating that difference as well. So, yeah, I think that's a really powerful and important clip. And Rosamund, I'm going to start with you because um, you're from Ghana and I think you've got a lot to say about this. Okay, so um, I was saying that I recognise some of the dishes she mentioned, actually, and, and, and I agree with the politics of it, that, you know, we get marginalised into certain types of food you know, and, and of course, Jamaican food is fantastic. And Jamaicans are a lot more than, say, Guyanese or Trinidadians. You know, that's, that's the history of what has happened in Britain. Um, and, but, but then people hook on to, you know, sort of ackee and sawfish or curry goat as being the main thing about Caribbean food. And, and it just marginalizes what we do. And so my, my view is to sort of broaden out what Caribbean food means. And although I'm from Guyana and that's in South America, I am of Caribbean culture more than I am of South American culture. Um, and, and, you know, that means that, you know, we, we celebrate food. I mean, like all Caribbean people, we celebrate food. We, we you know, it's a mood of communicating with your neighbors and your friends and, and so on and so forth. And, um, and so to pigeonhole us into one particular thing, you know, disturbs me. And so part of my mission, I suppose, is to sort of broaden that view, introduce Guyanese food with, and, and, and Trinidadian food and Barbadian food and let people have a glimpse of the beauty and the, and the sort of vast um, richness and range of what we cook and what we eat. And that's really terribly important because, you know, somebody said to me the other day, can you make me a Caribbean stew? And I thought, well, okay, let's start educating here because what is a Caribbean stew? Do you know what I mean? And uh, so, so it's, it's about exploring and making sure that it's not just about hot peppers. You know, they think to have Caribbean food, you must have hot peppers. No, we have fresh fruit, fresh vegetables, you know, lots of herbs and seasoning and marinating things overnight so that, you know, the food is rich and tasty. What, what do you think, Riaz? Do you think the phrase Caribbean cooking, which I know is what this event is called, is it a helpful phrase? Uh, I always found that it was helpful for kind of getting people um, an awareness of a kind of certain idea of the food. But yeah, as anyone will tell you from a different island, the food is wildly different from island to island. And in fact, uh, I would even question the notion of Jamaican food, when you kind of go to the island itself and travel around and look at the richness, I think the idea of what we've come to understand Jamaican food is does a great disservice um, to the kind of amazing food that you find on the island. Um, and so I mentioned before, you know, this is so diverse and the fact that it's been boiled down to rice and peas and curry goat um, is a shame when you as I said, when you go there and you see the amazing fruits and the veg and just the diverse nature of it all, and you go up into the mountains and you stay with the Rastafari and you see the way that they cook um, completely wholesome food with no meat, no fish. Um, then when you go to the coast and you see the amazing seafood dishes there and how innovative they are, yeah, it should be definitely challenged. So I think at one point it's helpful, um, but yeah, on the other hand, it does, it does, it does a disservice. Mm. Joe, do you want to come in here? Um, just to say that uh, Jamaicans don't help this issue at all because they're so braggadocious on, on, on the whole, you know. And that's how I was raised, that there was only one kind of Caribbean food, which was Jamaican. And uh, growing up and meeting people from other islands and tasting roti from Trinidad and food from other islands, um, had the great fortune of uh, going to Dominica where, oh my goodness, it's like the whole island 
live for food and live for quality, tasty food. And they just seem to eat like kings and queens. Um, one of my favorite dishes was krabak, um, where, you know, th there's a special mixture placed inside the, the crab and you crack it open and it's, and it's seasoned and, oh, it's just absolutely wonderful. Um, and yeah, um, if, we, if we could promote more, but that falls in line with myself as an actor, wanting to create more narratives and performance-based work, connecting Britain to the West Indies and the Caribbean. And then you can bring in a lot of the history behind the food as well, you know, like I grew up with cow foot and, you know, cow's ears and all, all these kind of dishes, which was not very much appealing to a child. But when you learn the history and you understand how significant it is to survival, but also how the people of African heritage and others who came in as well kind of created their own flair, kind of like there was a lot of oppression, a lot of repression in the Caribbean and people allowed their spirit, their true ancient spirit to flow through the one thing that they could do and is cooking and whichever home you go in and see anybody cooking, it's done with a flair, with a spirit and it's shared with a spirit as well, um, which I think is, is wonderful. And it doesn't belong to just one island. We do ourselves an injustice by thinking that. Mm. And I'm curious, what about the kind of the food scene in Leeds? Do you think is that Jamaican dominance, kind of how it is in Leeds as well? Um, th there is that, but we, um, the largest uh, population of West Indians in Leeds are actually from St. Kitts, St. Kitts and Nevis. And so um, we have the oldest outdoor carnival in Britain, in Europe. Um, our outdoor carnival started a year before Notting Hill came outside a building. And um, from the very first carnival, it was a great opportunity in 1968 um, for black people for the first time, because there were no restaurants then, to share their different um, food um, habits with the rest of, of Leeds and then it's it's grown and um, there are catering companies from all over the country coming and uh, providing Caribbean food, but it, 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 it does have a, a kind of sameness to it. And for me, that's about the wider social narratives that are being entertained because you've got to kind of create something that will appeal to the public and they will go, ooh. Whereas if we saw more on television about the diversity, of the West Indies and the connections to Britain, um, it, there would be more appreciation of, of that diversity. Having gone to the Caribbean and visited different islands, we need to bring that spirit here um, in some way, in whichever way, um, maybe a, a, just a big expo. You know, we have at Earl's Court or somewhere, or somewhere up north. Um, that, you know, yeah, just provides a real experience. And of course, many people from Britain go on holidays and they do experience these things. So maybe that's something we can build on or mm. should build on. Mm. Well, on that note, I, I want to quickly go back to Rosamund and Riaz and ask you if you think, um, are there some key things that sort of unite food across the region? I think for me it's the the narratives behind the transient nature of the food. Uh, and that's what I find so interesting about the Caribbean. Um, no matter what kind of uh, part of the world, you can find some part of that in Caribbean food. Um, and the stories behind that are fascinating. Um, you know, when I was a kid, my cousins had a, they had a Chinese uh, babysitter. Uh, and I was stunned because she had a stronger Jamaican accent than so like my own family. Uh, I didn't understand why. Um, and then obviously as I got older and learned the history of how many people from the Asian continent ended up in the Caribbean, it made complete sense to me. And then when you start thinking about all the foods that we enjoy there on the island, uh, yeah, it makes complete sense. So I think that 
kind of those stories behind the food. I think that's something that links all all dishes and all meals in the Caribbean that you'll find there's some inherent nature of kind of transition to it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Can I have a go? I, I, I agree with all of that. It's really, um, and what's, what's good about our cooking is it all came out for me, yeah? The mainstay of Caribbean cooking is the African connection. And, you know, we have that in common regardless of whichever island or mainland you're from. Um, and when I was writing my first cookie book, I, I, you know, I was just sort of exploring and experimenting with lots of different ideas and things. And one of the things that I found that linked us all is that African connection. For example, in Jamaica, you'd call um, Thai, well, it, it, it's, it's cornmeal cooked with raisins or coconut milk or what, and it's tied in a leaf that may be called Thai leaf or blue drawers. Because when you, blue blue, you know, the water turns blue, they call it blue drawers. Or um, if you went to Trinidad, it'd be called something else. Another, an island, we call it Dukunu. Um, mm. And, you know, but they all came out of what I found, Kenke, which is African. And in Guyana, we call it Kanki. And that thread runs through a particular dish like that, you know. So it's not about our differences, it's about our sameness and similarities. Mm. And how we and, and that we're one people really, you know. Yeah. So that's really crucial for me. Thanks, Rosamond. That's all so interesting. I'm gonna move us on to the next topic. Um, and this is about a theme that came up in the interviews, which is around how kind of cooking varies in and outside of the home and how migration patterns actually shift the boundaries of what and where home is. So I'm going to play two clips that speak to this dynamic. And the first is from Charlie Phillips, the Jamaican-born Notting Hill photographer, who had a restaurant in Wandsworth called Smokey Joe's in the 90s. Um, and the second is from Natasha Ramnarine, who's from Trinidad, and she moved to London in 2017, sorry, 2007. And she cooks and sells food on the weekends from her home, and it's called Natty Saturday Kitchen. So we can have clips two and three now. Different families used to cook for different people, yeah? They come home from work at least once a day, they can have a hot meal, and you'd go go in different people's houses, yeah? Well, my family, um, I had what you call a cook shop, yeah? Wasn't licensed, but they'd come round, if you're a working man, she used to cook for about 15 to 20 people. They'd come round to, her, to the house and have a meal there, and that's where it started out from a basement, yeah? And, um, the, well, they moved and they got a little shack in Portobello Road and that used to be crowded. That's the first introduction to Caribbean food as such, you know. Then you had the mangrove and others, yeah, but they could get started. And it was very difficult because in those days, the banks would lend you money, you know. Coming to London, like leaving a small island and coming to London is a real kind of shifting in culture if i wanted roti back then i'd go to there was only one place that you could go as a trinidadian to buy roti that was in um in clapham north outside clapham north station it was a place called roti jupa and um going there was just like you know going walking into the sunshine because they were all trini in there and they would give you a pecan and you know you would just kind of catch up about things that were happening in Trinidad and it was such a sweet little space to just as I said go and walk in the sunshine for a little bit. The first one was Charlie Phillips um talking about cook shops in the 50s and 60s and I think Joe you can speak to that in a minute um, and then Natty talking about Roti Jupa being like going for a walk in the sunshine, which is a really wonderful clip. And I wanted to start with you, Riaz, because of course, Belly Full, which is I have here, which is I recommend everyone get a copy. It's an amazing book. Um, of course, it's totally focused on cooking and eating in public and commercial spaces. And I just wanted to get you to sort of describe what you think the differences are between cooking and eating in public and private. Um, I think then the idea behind Belly Four was that that distinction wasn't as important as the food itself, and that 
people would turn to these places initially because of that disconnection between their own home. Um, and so they kind of found new homes in these public spaces. Um, and these places became those kind of central hubs that the local cook shop in where they're from in the Caribbean might have been. Um, obviously there's that kind of, when you're at home, there's all the cooking behind it um, and everything that goes into the cooking, the shopping, you know, going into the kitchen and seeing someone cooking and the smells. But I feel like for those who were kind of taken from their home or for those who are no longer at their home that still can get that, that nostalgia and that same feeling from these places. And I think that's why they're so important. And that's why I wanted to document them. Mm. Yeah, so that, yeah, kind of feelings of home in these, yeah, in public space. Um, Rosamond, could you, you know, so you've used to own a restaurant, you obviously cook lots at home and you've written a cookbook and I will move on to your kind of lockdown cooking in the next section. But yeah, for you, what are the main differences between these different types of cooking? Gosh, it is very different. If I'm cooking for my granddaughter or grandchildren, I've got a few of them, um, at home is a completely different thing because you're looking at what they like, what they don't like, you know, um, and, and all that kind of stuff. Once you take it out of the home arena, and you're cooking for a stranger, um, you know, it's a whole different process for me. And I suppose they, I see them in three different ways. And I'll sort of talk about that very briefly. Um, so if I was gonna come and cook for somebody I didn't know, I'd first consult with that person, ask them about their favorite ingredients, the food, you know, the food that um, creates memories for them. You know, I would design their unique menu, first of all, on a laptop, literally, to down to the last detail to capture, you know, some of the things that they're talking about and make sure it's accurate. Um, to make it a memorable occasion, so I would design something for that person, for a wedding uh, and so on and so forth. Um, but when you come to pu more public cooking, let's say it's not in someone's, in, in someone's house, you know. Um, I've cooked, for example, um, on the slopes of Alexandra Palace, in the 90s, you know, where there was the African music village or a jazz, um, a, a sort of jazz occasion, you know, a, a jazz festival. And, and that is cooking in a tent, you know, um, and mass producing curries and all that kind of stuff. It was very exciting. And, you know, it, it, it was just a different kind of thing to do in public. Um, and then I have stuff like cooking in the restaurant, which is, again, you're cooking for the public, but you know, we're using home ideas and turning them into something that looks nice on a plate, but maintaining the essence of what Caribbean cooking is about, which is fresh everything um, and marinated stuff. And then I've had, um, I actually cooked for uh, the late Prince, you know, um, superstar Prince, um, yeah. had for after concert parties in, in, in London um, and, um, the restaurant was asked to, to produce food. I was asked to produce my style of Caribbean cooking, which is quite creative. Um, at the time, you know, it was very exciting. And um, the, what happened was that we cooked huge amounts of food because he was going to entertain like 200 superstar mates. Um, and, you know, they, and the food had to be nice and interesting, but also um, to feed people that you don't know, you know. It, we don't know, we didn't know them. Um, and so we cooked huge amounts of food. And then um, I think it, the, the, the company, I can't think what they're called now, um, wasn't Virgin, it was the other one, uh, I, whoever booked me anyway, they, they'd they say, look, um, we can't tell you where you're going to be serving the food until the very last minute, because Prince's security, you know, we can't do that. So we get all this stuff loaded into the van and then they say, okay, could you go to the top of the Hilton, please? And we shoot off to the top of the Hilton and you find there was no cooking facility. There's no reheating. So everything had to be absolutely hot on arrival, served up, produced beautifully, um, you know, and so the stuff would be decorating and, you know, so yes, I mean, food is different wherever you're going to, yeah. It, it just depends on the situation, the occasion, and and so on. Yeah, it is very different to cooking in the kitchen at home. 
That's great. Thanks, Rosamond. That's a great story. Um, Joe, could you tell us a bit about kind of the history in Leeds of sort of cookshops and places that were set up? Um, well, I mean, first of all, primarily it was always the home. Um, visiting friends and relatives, you would always be fed. I think that was always like a given. There always seemed to be food in the pot. Um, but one of my uh, early experiences of experiencing different West Indian food was church. And uh, everybody would bring their home food cooking and you'd taste different things. And then you'd go to co church conventions. And it was in Birmingham that I discovered they made dumpling that was, was big and that it had the meat inside. Never seen that before in my life, not in Leeds, but it made a lot of sense. And I don't understand why we haven't franchised that. Um, it's, it's a great concept um, to have curried chicken inside the dumpling. You can just eat on the go. Brilliant idea. Um, and then shops came around in the 1970s. Of course, there was funerals and weddings. There would always be food uh, for sustenance. Um, and if you couldn't wait for a funeral or wedding, then there was the blues. Ah. There was a blues party that started late at night. You'd go down into somebody's basement. There'd be a hatch. You give them the money. You get your food. You hold your corner against the wall and you eat your food. And the, the base is pumping and everything's sweet. Um, but when it came to shops and having to produce regularly, which I'm sure uh, the other speakers will testify to, it's very difficult to sustain to sustain a, a quality, um, especially getting the staff as well, I think in, in West Indian shops. And some of my relatives open shops and it's, you know, it's incredibly hard work and you need a network uh, around you. But still to this day, uh, for me, there's no substitute for home cooked food, um, even if it is, then put into a reheatable pan and taken somewhere. It's cooked in the home. Um, it's very different from the shop. And uh, I still have, you know, go for home cooked food above shop food today. Thanks, Joe. Okay, I'm just gonna move us up. I'm gonna ask my last question before we go to the audience Q&A. Um, and it's about the relationship between food and community. And Rosamond, I'll start with you. And I wanted to know how food has shaped your response to the pandemic over the last year. Yeah, I know. Oh yeah, um, that was very challenging for me. Um, first of all, I, I, my um, household, the key workers, frontline workers. And so I, I actually left my home because, you know, I had to isolate. Obviously that's what over people of a certain age had to do. And so I went to stay at um, an empty family flat, fortunately. Um, and uh, so that was the first challenging thing that I was then cooking for myself, which I've never, I don't think I've ever just cooked for myself. So I started producing um, food for the family and they'd come round and I'd hand it to them at the front door because I just, you know, you want to cook for your family and, and of course they missed it. And then um, talking to the neighbours in the road I was living in, um, we found out that there was a food um, bank nearby um, and we were donating tins and, and so on and so forth, you know, because Haringey is a pretty needy borough and, you know, they, we, we were just um, su supporting uh, the families that were going to the food bank. Um, and then I had this idea to, to, be, to, to offer my services because I thought I'm sitting here feeling a bit lazy, you know. Um, and so I, I went down to the local food bank and say, you know, I can cook. Um, can I help you kind of thing? And they snapped me up. Um, and from there on, it's a journey. I've been doing that for about a year and a bit. Um, and basically, you know, there's a food hub. I, I, I knew nothing about this a, a year and a half ago, but I do now. So there's this big sort of church hall, basically, full of food. And so I I'd, uh, I'd go in with my mask. And um, what happened was I had started doing it on my own, out from my own resources. Um, and then some kind person 
said to me, oh, you know, it's not sustainable. You can't do this. You can't just keep donating food. And I'm talking about cooking about 50 meals uh, every Thursday, 50 to 50 and 70 meals. Um, and so they said, it's not sustainable. And I said, well, I don't want to give back. I don't want to take from families. And they said, no, but if you cook the food we have here, we're giving it to families and we can deliver to people who are vulnerable. So, um, so I said, okay, that sounds all right. So I go in and it was really interesting actually, because you walk into this church hall and it was just full of all kinds of food. It's like being in a, you know, on MasterChef, they have the mystery box. It's like being given a mystery box. And I didn't know, I look around and think, okay, where do I start here? And so I start in my head thinking, what can I make from the resources that are here? And some of them were limited. Sometimes they get lots of donation of fruit, fruit and veg and that kind of stuff. And sometimes you just have lots of tins and lots of pasta, and lots of rice and stuff. Um, and so I go around and just choose the things that I can visualize a dish from. And I offered Caribbean vegetarian and vegan food um, because it's too complicated, you know, cooking meat and stuff. And I wanted to popularize, you know, vegetarian and vegan food. I think that it's really important. I mean, I don't eat meat anyway. So, um, so I gather up lots of tomatoes and, you know, lots of fresh produ produce, and then they'd give you, you know, tin stuff as well. And I come back home and I've got a, a, a Greek, uh, a Cypriot neighbor next door. And um, she saw me bringing all these things in and she said, okay, um, I'll help you to peel. And so she actually would peel 10 pounds of potatoes, 10 pounds of carrots, 10 pounds of onions, you know, that kind of quantity. And she'd peel and chop everything the day before. Um, and then we keep it in the fridge, in, in our fridges. And then the next day on a Thursday morning, you know, nobody phones me because what I'm doing is assembling food, you know, um, into in huge saucepans and, and cooking um, from scratch. Uh, and, you know, and, and that in itself was a challenge because you have to, whereas I can chop some potatoes and put it into a saucepan and, and, and just make a, a vegetable stew, you know, I had to think of ways to, to maximize on that. So the potatoes, I'd shove them all into the oven on two huge trays and I'd season the potatoes with herbs and spices so it gets the flavor. And the thing about vegetarian food is that some things can be quite bland. So I, I would treat it as if it was a meat. And so I'd season up the potatoes or carrots or whatever, shove them olive oil, shove them into the oven and roast them down. And then it meant that I could have volume cooking in the saucepan. Then I tip it all in at the last minute. And so you come up with these really nice flavors. And then I have to pack them and label them. This again, cooking for the public, you've got to be aware of all the food laws and the hygiene regulations and that kind of safety stuff. And so you have to label them into plastic containers. And I'd be labeling, well, I mean, I'd labeled the night before. I, I, I made the labels up. And one of the, my mistakes one day was that I was so used to throwing things in. And I suddenly thought, oh my gosh, I must follow what I've designed, i.e. on the label, because of allergens and things like that. So you have to be so careful to put exactly what you're putting on the, you know, on what it says on the label into the saucepan. And so that was quite a challenge. And I'd pack it all up and, and I'd take it down to the, the food bank and there'd be queues of people going to get other food, you know, going to get their shopping and stuff. And what was so heartening one day is that um, somebody said to me, that there's, a, there's some um, Romanian women there waiting to talk to you because they want your recipe. And they'd say, Things like, you know, when is that Caribbean woman bringing her food? <laughs> you know? And it always went hot because I wake up at about seven and by 10.30, it was all done. And I take it down there. So it was hot and fresh and they appreciated it. And what's so nice is knowing that the food I was cooking, actually, it went right across races because there'd be black people in the queue, Asians in the queue, there'd be Eastern Europeans in the queue and people just loved it. I just couldn't produce enough, really. Thank you, Rosamond. I'm gonna. I'm just gonna cut you off there because we've got so many audience questions, and lots of them are actually directed to you. But I will say that Haringey is very lucky to have you. Oh, thank um, you. <laughs> and I'll start off. Um, so, someone um, we've got Sunita, and Sunita's asked a question. She said, 
You've talked about bringing Caribbean food into the home and how important it is for second and third generations in the UK who may not have such a big influence from Caribbean culture in their lives. Where do you start with food to help bring it into the home? Any advice on who to follow or easy recipes to start with and where to start? That's me. I'll, well, I'll start, I'm Riaz off with that. Yes, yes yeah, I need a breather. <laughs> oh, you, may just, you can just go on Instagram. Instagram or YouTube and type in Caribbean food um, and you'll find uh, all the people doing amazing Caribbean food, um, both in the UK and the USA, Canada, uh, Jamaica, of course. Yeah, throughout the Caribbean, that's the great thing about the internet and social media now um, is that you know, you've got the access to this knowledge just like right from the source. And no matter kind of what your outlook on food is, if you're vegan, if you're avid meat eater or seafood, uh, you'll find something for you. Thanks, Riaz. Um, Rosamond, do you want to come in with a recipe? <laughs> <laughs> instant recipe. An instant quick no, recipe. I mean, I, what, what I would say is, um, is to take what Caribbean food is about. So um, you don't have to have yams and plantains and so on and so forth necessarily. But what you need is to use the techniques that we use. For example, um, when I've got quiet moment, I will buy, I make my own green seasoning, for example, yeah? Um, I would get spring onions, onions, sweet peppers, you know, green preferably, um, and uh, what else, I put ginger, um, lots of garlic, um, and onion, and perhaps some herbs, fresh, everything fresh, and blitz them in a blender, and, Put them, no salt or anything, uh, and oh, and a scotch bonnet. You know, I say one scotch bonnet because they're quite hot. So blitz them all up, put them in a jar, and this comes out of our, uh, I mean, throughout the Caribbean islands, you know, this green seasoning exists. In Guyana, we make one as well, and that's where obviously where mine, com my, mine comes from. But you can put your favorite things into that, and you keep it in a jar in the fridge, um, and you use it it's very easy then to season up some chicken rather than just having plain chicken that you can also do that with a spice mix you get all the dry spices keep them in a jar and so the essence of, of what we do so well in the caribbean is seasoning up something to make it taste fantastic mm -hmm. um Thanks. yeah Thanks, i'm gonna joe i'm gonna um i've got another question for you a different one and this comes from patricia and Patricia came from a family that comes from Portland Parish in Jamaica, where jerk, um, jerk originates. And she, she said she's watched what she's called jerk change hugely over the years. What do the panelists think about such changes? Is it evolution or dissipation of a tradition? I don't know. If you... Oh, sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. Let's yeah. go Joe and then Riaz. Uh, yeah, um, I'll, I'll try to be quick on this. Um... Yes, I mean, there was a big furore around um, jerk rice being a thing. And um, I think it's evolution. You can't put anything out there that can't be appropriated by others because West Indians are notorious for taking things from here, taking things from there and putting it all in a pot. That's the tradition. It's not nice when it happens to us because of the history, because of so many things being taken away. If you go back to the Benin expedition in the late 1800s where Benin was destroyed, when they raided the palace at Magdala and took significant religious and cultural items, we lost our freedom during transatlantic trade. Please don't take our food. Um, but part of food is about sharing. We can't stop that. What we have to do is to be more inventive you named uh, Portland in Jamaica as a place where jerk chicken is done. We'll give it the name, Portland Jerk. Be proud of that. Tell the story of Portland so that we know that it's a certain kind of jerk with a certain kind of quality and not to be confused with everything else. So let's give things names. Um, it's a very rich heritage and there's a lot of diversity, as Riaz was saying, in, in Jamaica. But there's also generosity. Um, as Rosman demonstrates by feeding people, we're very naturally generous. Let's not lose that. Thanks, Joe. Riaz, do you want to come in? Uh, no, yeah, I was just going to say the issue of 
that kind of change a lot of the times is the danger is that the origin is lost. Um, obviously, as you mentioned, that the Caribbean is so diverse and the influences that went into the um, creation of the Caribbean are so diverse. But a lot of the kind of things that occur now in the... Uh, <laughs> a lot of the things that occur now in the UK are so overtly capitalist and money-driven. Um, if you look at the way that food evolved up until a certain point in the Caribbean was purely to do with survival. Um, and then after that survival, it was a lot about tradition and keeping culture and heritage alive, especially as you mentioned, the, as I mentioned, the transient nature of the Caribbean and how people, the diaspora is so spread out around the world. It was really important to keep that culture and heritage alive. Um, but the change and evolution now we see just looks to just capitalize on it for the kind of the glam and the, the exoticness of it. Uh, and the origin is forgotten. So when you have things like, as you mentioned, jerk rice, it completely destroys that chain and that link to their origin heritage. When you think about what jerk is and what it means and the importance of it for Caribbean history, yeah, we've got to be careful yeah. that that doesn't get uh, lost and destroyed. But that, that's up to us to positively promote mm -hmm. rather than, you know, let it evolve. We really have to take active, mm -hmm. um, intervention. Yeah, but also, I mean, when I went to Jamaica a couple of years ago, um, I went to Portland and we were disappointed in the jerk because they were pandering to tourists and some tourists don't want pepper, some people don't want garlic. You know, I'm thinking stuff, it, you know, why? You know, cook your jerk. You, know, you don't have to put tons of hot pepper in it, but cook it authentically, maintain that. Do you know what I mean? And people can buy it or leave it. But I think it's been watered down and I, I, myself and the children were very disappointed, I must admit. But then you get very good jerk chicken in London. There are lots of places, you know, Tottenham and other places that sell brilliant jerk. And Leeds. Leeds, they. <laughs> <laughs> Rosamund, um, we've got a question from you and this is from Julia Alexander and she said, it's wonderful to hear you connect our cooking with the African diaspora. I'm a huge fan, love your books and your wonderful restaurant Bambaya in Crouch End back in the day, which was the go-to place for fabulous food and entertainment, plus the fact that you cook for so many food banks during lockdown. My question is, how can we enthuse our young British-born black youngsters about healthy, tasty Caribbean cooking? Yeah, this is a steep one, I must admit. And thanks, Juliet, um, for the question. Um, how do we convince them? I think you model it. You know, um, in, in, in our household, uh, my, well, they're, not, they're not all in the household. My grandchildren are spread around a bit in different houses and um, we entertain every now and again and I introduce things. Um, so for example, uh, when I was growing up in Guyana, um, your parents educated your palate by, for example, if you don't like spinach, they mix it with chicken. So you'd have shrimp and, 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 and spinach, or you can have, you know, you, you sort of introduce things in that way. You slip, slip it in um, and, and you talk about it. You talk about food, you get them to help you to cook. You know, my granddaughter, Jessica, when I was doing the food bank, she would um, be opening all the packages. Cause you know, when you pick up the food, she would be opening the spices for me. You get um, different companies giving, giving um, different spices and, and so on. To, to the food bank and I, I need them in bulk. So she would spend you know, a couple of hours cutting and, and saying, this one smells good granny and what is this one? And you know, you're telling this is, you know, and talking to them about food, talking to them about, you know, and helping them to, to create their own, you know, if you're doing scrambled eggs, they would, if you put a little bit of smoked paprika in there or if you put a bit of this or put some garlic in it, you know, but but really communicating with your children through food is really important. Um, help, helping them to see the goodness of fresh veg and fresh fruit. I also sort of used to go into schools and talk to children about food. So if you're a Caribbean parent out in Leeds or wherever, you know, say, look, can I come and talk to the class about, you know, what Caribbean food is truly about? And some children don't know. They don't know that, you know, chocolate isn't 
in a, in a Mars bar or whatever, you know, it, it is actually a real thing that grows on a tree, cocoa pod, just educate people about it. I mean, that's the best I can yeah. do yet. Thanks. Thank, thanks, Rosamond. I think, you know, that, yeah, the topic of kind of education and food is so important. Um, we've got another question from Philip Abraham, and it's how much do you think the availability or lack of particular ingredients has shaped the way that Caribbean food has evolved in the UK? I'm wondering in particular if Caribbean meat dishes were easier to reproduce in the UK because pork, goat, chicken, etc., was already available, but fish recipes don't seem to figure as much in the UK, despite flying fish being the national dish of Barbados, maybe because the kind of fish used in the region has been harder to come by. I'll start with Riaz on this one. Um, I think it's hard to, it's, tr it's really hard to put into words the difference of flavor in the fruit when you get it directly from the source in the Caribbean or Africa compared to where you get it here. And I think that really has an effect on uh, the food and that kind of dynamism um, in the taste. But I'd agree that up to a certain point, um, availability of ingredients can hamper food's growth, but the fact that that hasn't stopped other cultures makes me believe that that's not the real reason that the food hasn't progressed to a certain level that other communities' foods have in this country. Yeah. Joe, do you yeah. want to come in on this? Um, as, as we're coming close to time, I just want to put a, a historical context going back thousands of years to Queen Hatshepsut, of ancient Kemet or Egypt um, thousands of years ago. We know she's the most powerful ruler of all time, male or female. And she ex we know that because she expanded the empire and expanded trade. She's the fir first person who's recorded to be involved in economic botany, um, which is the foundations of transatlantic trade really. But um, what she did was, you know, find different spices, particularly in different places. And that informs us that they loved, you know, spices in their food thousands of years ago. This is something that came down to us in West Africa. And it's not so much just the African traditions that traveled to the West Indies, but as I was saying before, the spirit. In ancient Kemet, they believed in Ma'at, which had seven principles like truth, justice, harmony, balance, reciprocity. If you put those values in your cooking and it's part of your family values, those are traditions that are, you know, are kind of come part and parcel um, with the traditions, but we're in challenging times. As well as uh, it being difficult to get hold of certain foods, we also have to think of carbon footprints. And as Rosamond was saying, we have to kind of rethink how we do things sometimes. You don't have to do the same things that traditions have done, but you keep the same spirit, as Rosamond was saying. Thanks, Joe. Well, we're nearing the end. So Rosamond, I'll just um, see if you want to chip in anything to that last question. No, I've just learned something about that really important that you were telling us about there, Joe. It's really great to hear that. Um, yeah, I think I think if you're living in in, in the far and wide, wherever you can go on the internet and get things, you can import things. I mean, you know, not import, you know, sort of get things posted to you that if you want particularly, because it is available in, in, in England, in, in London in particular, but, you know, you can also, you know, just get all kinds of different herbs, spices, etc. And as, as Joe was saying, it's the essence of putting your love and, and you know, creativity into that dish. Um, you don't have to be able to get a plant in if you're living in way out in Scotland. Um, but, you know, it's about, you know, how you cook. Use coconut milk, you know, that, that's very Caribbean. We haven't talked about coconut as the mainstay in, our, in one of our, you know, in our, you know, in, and um, you can cook vegetables down in coconut milk and pop the chili into it if you want. Do you know what I mean? It's, yeah, and that's a dish from Guyana called Metaji, but you you can use anything you like in it. The essence is the coconut milk cooked down and sort of curdles over the food. And then you can serve that with roast chicken or fried fish or anything. Thanks, Rosamond. Well, I think that is a delicious note to end things on. And I think a really important message about kind of being creativity, 
creative and harnessing what you have. I just want to end with one last comment from Melanie Harney, who says, I can't stop thinking about that dumpling with curry inside, and I'd love to have <laughs> dinner at Rosamond's. And I just say a huge thank you to Rosamond, Riaz and Joe. I know there'll be a huge round of applause if we were in person right now. And it's been such a pleasure to have you here and to get to ask you these questions. And I've learned so much. And thank you for such amazing audience questions and for everyone coming along. And a big thank you to Russell, Ro Holly Russell and everyone at the food season um, for helping to organize the event. And of course, the Echo Center that have supported the whole project. Don't forget to check out the Caribbean Foodways blog by clicking on the link below. Thank you and have a lovely evening and a delicious dinner. Thank you so much. What an amazing event. Right at the beginning, Rosamond said that her world is about feeding people literally and metaphorically. And I think that the, this panel and Naomi have fed us all metaphorically. I feel I'm hungry, but I feel full with ideas and just wonderful thank you so much also wonderful to know i've been keeping an eye on the questions we've got people uh listening in from florida from yana all over the world and all over the uk so that is just also wonderful so welcome to everybody who's watched and thank you for watching um do check out our final event for the food season on friday i mentioned it was about um the high street and childhood obesity should be a very lively and topical discussion um do visit the food season web uh, web pages to enter our british library kitchen aid competition you can win a cordless kitchen aid appliance a day on a cookery course and a signed copy of uh the wonderful the pie room by callum franklin so that's worth checking out before the competition closes on Friday. So this is it for us. Good night uh, for this evening. Thank you to KitchenAid for um, sponsoring us, but mostly thank you to Naomi, Rosamond, Riaz and Joe for the most delicious, nutritious evening of discussion. Thank you. Good night.